Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. Welcome to The World Over Live. We've got a great show for you this evening. Are you looking for a movie you can take the kids to without offending your sensibilities and theirs? Comedian, actor, producer, and writer Kevin James, whom you might remember as the King of Queens, joins me for an exclusive interview about his movies, the lovable characters he's created, and the faith that motivates him. We'll also give you a sneak peek at his new film, Here Comes the Boom, which opens in theaters everywhere on October 12th. And later, a major archdiocese in California installed its new leader last week, not without some controversy. Archbishop Salvatore Cordelioni is here to discuss his new post as head of San Francisco's half a million Catholics and he'll give us his take on the challenges and opportunities he faces there. Finally, what is this year of faith instituted by Pope Benedict? What's it really all about? The Pope explains, and we'll bring you excerpts from his homily from the opening mass of the year of faith. Now, I want you to be part of the program. Email us now, worldover at EWTN.com. Let's get things started. Here's the brief news from the world over this week. A momentous week for the Catholic Church. Thursday marked the 50th anniversary of the opening of Vatican II, the Ecumenical Council on the Church and the Modern World. Pope Benedict commemorated the historic event by calling a synod of bishops on the new evangelization and a year of faith for the Universal Church. The Pope opened the synod for the new evangelization with Holy Mass on Sunday. Some 200 cardinals and bishops from around the world and thousands of faithful were in attendance. During the synod, its Relator General, Washington Archbishop Donald Cardinal Wuerl, blamed poor catechesis and what he calls a tsunami of secular influence for destroying societal institutions like traditional marriage, family, and objective right and wrong. New York Archbishop Timothy Cardinal Dolan, attending his first worldwide synod of bishops, emphasized the importance of the sacraments, particularly confession, calling it the sacrament of evangelization, because it brings all of us to a conversion of heart. And later in the week, on Thursday, the pontiff opened the aforementioned Year of Faith with a special mass at St. Peter's Square. He called for a new evangelization based on, quote, an authentic interpretation of the Second Vatican Council. The Mass was reminiscent of the opening of Vatican II, with over 400 bishops from around the world processing in. The same book of the Gospels used at the Council was also used at Thursday's Mass, where the Pope concelebrated with 14 of the surviving 70 Council Fathers. Toward the close of the liturgy, Pope Benedict reenacted Pope Paul VI's original closing of the Second Vatican Council by reading a series of messages to the people of God. Each message was addressed to specific groups in society, like scientists, artists, workers, and women. Later, we'll catch up with one of those representatives, someone you may know, a former guest of this show. Stay tuned for that. And a small bit of history was made during Pope Benedict's Wednesday general audience as well. This is the Pope speaking in Arabic. For the first time, Arabic was among the languages spoken during the weekly papal audience. The Holy Father's message was really simple. Quote, the Pope prays for all the Arabic-speaking people. God bless you all. Going forward, a summary of the Pope's weekly catechesis given in Italian will now be provided in Arabic along with various other languages. The Vatican said the addition of Arabic grew out of the Holy Father's recently released exhortation on the church in the Middle East. It's a way to express support for the Christians there and to remind all Catholics of the need to pray for peace in the region. Benghazi and Big Bird took up much of the political discourse for the first part of this week in the United States when the issue of abortion returned to the presidential campaign trail. 
Republican Mitt Romney made headlines when he told the Des Moines Register on Tuesday, quote, there's no legislation with regards to abortion that I'm familiar with that would become part of my agenda, end quote. The comment raised eyebrows on both sides. President Barack Obama's campaign was quick to pounce, claiming the comment was inconsistent with previous comments made by the candidate. Romney sought to clarify his position at a campaign stop on Wednesday. I think I've said that time and again, I'm a pro-life candidate, I'll be a pro-life president. Romney further repeated what he told the Des Moines Register, namely that he would push to defund Planned Parenthood and restore the Mexico City policy, which forbids U.S. funding of abortion groups overseas. On Thursday in North Carolina, Romney discussed religious liberty with 93-year-old evangelical icon Billy Graham. During the half-hour meeting, Graham is quoted as saying, I'll do all I can to help you, and you can quote me on that, end quote. Paolo Gabrielli, the Pope's former butler, has been sentenced to 18 months in prison after being found guilty of stealing confidential Vatican papers. In his final address to the court on Saturday, Gabrielli told the judges, I do not feel like I'm a thief, and that he acted only out of visceral love for the Church of Christ and for its visible head on earth. Gabrielli was arrested and charged in May over what became known as the Vatileak scandal. A search of his apartment turned up confidential papers, including personal correspondence to and from the Pope, which subsequently appeared in the Italian press. Gabrielli worked in the papal household under both John Paul II and Benedict XVI. Vatican spokesman Father Federico Lombardi said the possibility of a papal pardon for Gabrielli was very concrete and very likely. The crackdown continues on the church in China, this time in Shanghai. Sources tell Union of Catholic Asian News that government officials there recently required diocesan priests and nuns to take what they call study classes to reinforce the doctrine of the Chinese communist regime. Strain on church-state relations has intensified since July when Bishop Thaddeus Ma Daquin announced his resignation from the government-backed Patriotic Association during his ordination mass, his government-approved ordination mass. Since then, the communist regime postponed the start of seminary classes. Bishop Ma and other prelates have been detained, and the bishop is reportedly still on retreat with a certain degree of freedom. The three-day government crash course for priests and nuns was held at the Shanghai Institute of Socialism. It included training on state religion relations, the Communist Party's religious concepts, socialism, etc. According to one priest who attended the classes, the Catholic Church was not openly criticized, but they were clearly designed to enforce the authority of the regime. And the Nobel Prize for Medicine was awarded to two men for their work on adult stem cell research. Shinya Yamanaka of Japan, building off of the work of John Gurdon of the United Kingdom some 40 years earlier, took adult stem cells and made them the equivalent of embryonic stem cells, so-called blank slate cells. Such cells can be coaxed into other cell types. Gurdon declared his 1962 discovery, where he cloned tadpoles from specialized cells as having no obvious therapeutic benefit at all. Time proved him wrong, as his research became the foundation for Yamanaka in 2006, when he was able to reprogram adult stem cells taken from the skin of mice and later humans. The research holds hope for treating an array of diseases from Parkinson's to diabetes by growing customized tissue from one's own body for transplant. The rapid advancement of adult stem cell research has all but brought to an end the practical debate over embryonic stem cell research. Researchers and researcher dollars have migrated to the less complicated and ethically licit adult stem cell technology. And one other Nobel note, Reuters is reporting that Archbishop John Oniukan of Ubuju 
Nigeria is among the leading candidates for the Nobel Peace Prize. Oniukan has been recognized for his efforts in calming relations between Christians and Muslims at a time when the terrorist group Boko Haram has escalated its jihad against Christians and the West. When we return, he's been the King of Queens, a mall cop, and a zookeeper. Now he's an amateur cage fighter. Emmy Award nominated actor comedian Kevin James is here to tell us about his many roles and the animating force behind them. When the World Over Live continues, stay right there. What if I dunk this ball in that hoop, then you have dinner with me at my house Friday night? What do you say? You dunk a basketball? Please. Fine. And take the bed. Deal. Where are you going? <gasps> oh, no, 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 no. Come on, that's cheating. No, it's not. That's, uh, no, that's not what I... Dreams are about to come true. Nightmares. That go in? For nine seasons, my first guest was the beloved Doug Heffernan on the hit CBS sitcom The King of Queens. And since that time, he's won a large audience, including families, with films such as Zookeeper and the 2009 smash hit Paul Blart Mall Cop, a big film in my house. His new film, Here Comes the Boom, fits in nicely with his earlier work. It is the story of a schoolteacher, Scott Voss, who ends up moonlighting as a mixed martial arts fighter in order to help a fellow teacher keep his job. He sat down with me recently in New York City to talk about his life, his wildly successful career, and the Catholic faith that undergirds it all. Here's my exclusive interview with Kevin James. My first question, how do you go from Nipfing to James? I want to know that transition, your, your real name being Kevin. Nipfing. Nipfing. Yeah, yeah, yes. It was uh, in stand-up. It was during stand-up. The name uh, K-N-I-P-F-I-N-G was so difficult to pronounce that when uh, it would just get mangled every time mm -hmm. I would go up on stage doing stand-up. <laughs> so we just came up with uh, Kevin James, who was a martial arts instructor who's actually in this movie of, of mine. Very, you know, his name was James Robinson, so I just took his first name. Oh, you took it from a martial <clears throat> arts? Because you're a real fan of this, of this genre, of this sport. I was a big arts. fan back in the day, in 1993, but I, uh, of the, I saw the first UFC, and then I became a fan of these fighters. I honestly, because... You know, you think of them as these gladiators mm -hmm. that are just these angry guys that are, you know, beating up everybody. And they couldn't be further from that. The guys that I met are the nicest guys. They're family men. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, fighting for different reasons, whether yeah. it's putting food on the table for their kids or mm -hmm. for other family members or whatever it may be. What they do is something I would never do, and that's what made it kind of interesting to me. You know, it's yeah. like, what would you, you know, risk your life for? You know, what would you really, you know, and these guys really go for it. Yeah, and this movie, Here Comes the Boom, is really about sacrifice oh, yeah. on, on, on a certain level. Tell me a little about that and how that relates to what you're seeing in the world, what, you're, what do you experience in your own life? Well, this is what we wanted to put out there. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's really is. There's no greater love than laying one's life down for a friend, you know, mm -hmm. and that's really what it was about. Um, we all become complacent at one point uh, or another in your life, and, and that's what this teacher does. In, he's a, he was a great teacher at one point. Uh, he kind of turns into a guy who oh, kind of punches the clock and lost his way a yeah. little bit and doesn't oh, put the effort in. Here. And uh, it ago. takes somebody it's else. It's Henry though. Winkler who runs the, the, the music, music program. program. Exactly, which is going to be, you know, they're suffering cuts. So um, he sees him and he kind of falls into having to defend him and, and trying to raise the money for him. But, you know, it's, it's in that that, you know, my character gets inspired to, you know, overcome some odds, wake up, yeah. and uh, help another human being, which in turn helps himself become a better man, a better, yeah. you know, a uh, person that helps his brother, who helps the, the, the kids, the students, and the community, and it's kind of like a ripple effect. Yeah, he finds himself through the sacrifice. Absolutely. This, it's a torturous path. Yes. We're going to get into it in yes. a minute. I want to back up a little bit. I want to talk about you for a moment. Sure. You, you mentioned stand-up. Ten years you labored in stand-up, starting in Long Island, your native-born son of Long Island. Uh, that, was a, that was a pretty long, arduous path. You and Ray Romano were 
Palace yes, in back in '89, we started doing stand up, and still do to this day. By yeah, the way. Why, I mean, you're about to do. A, uh, I noticed a, a, a date in Vegas. Why do you keep doing? You certainly don't need the, the money. At no, this point. no, but you know why what? do you do it? Because I love it. It's you know it's in, and maybe because I was so naive doing it in the beginning and not. I didn't really have the plan of hey, I got to make a TV show here and uh -huh. I've got to you know make it to film by here and do this mm -hmm. and that. I just enjoyed what I was doing at the time, and uh, I still do. I still love it. I love that you know immediate response you get from a stand-up. Is audience. it audience research for you? That I, you, you become sensitized sure. to what the audience, what they, what they want, where they are. Yes, yeah, you can kind of feel. You get it definitely. Oh. I mean, it, I, I relate it to boxing all the time too, and even mm -hmm. in, in, in fighting because you can see you know when an audience is giving and taking, and you can take information from that, and it's you know it's how you use it. Yeah. So many know you from the King of Queens. Um, Paul Blart, which I have to talk about in a moment, which to my children is like the pattern oh, of their film-going experience. I have to tell you, it's like this is the holy grail. Well, I have Indiana Jones, they have Paul the, Blart, and I'm serious. No, well, the mustaches and all yes. down in the basement, yeah, I'm they, telling you. But l let's talk about uh, your character on King of Queens. He was so relatable. He was so accessible from everybody, from New York to Iowa to Illinois, all the way to the other coast. There was something about that character, Doug, that so uh, attracted people, I think. What is it, and what of that do you preserve in this character, in Scott Voss in your new movie? I think in any character I do, I try to bring, you know, what I have that's unique to me, but but yet everybody can kind of see, I, I, the, the everyday guy, you know, and, and people can kind of see my character through my eyes, and hopefully, and, and kind of go through the experiences that I'm going through, the journey that I go through, you know, with them. You know, uh, you can look at, like, James Bond and, and love a movie like that because it's something you may never do, uh, or you can love a movie like this, you know, hopefully, because it's something that you can see yourself going, I see myself in that character, you know, and, and I can kind of take that journey with him, and that's what I hope the audience member takes away with them you know they, they, they go through this with me They're, well and it's also uh, and and I know you bristle or might a little bit at this but people have been saying you are the king of clean yes. are you offended by that no, no, no. And I mean, they're, they're referring to your movies are, <clears throat> they, they, there's no profanity, there's no gratuitous violence, there's no excessive well, stuff. Families can see this together. Yeah, I mean, I'm growing more and more that way and, and, mm -hmm. and, and want to be that way. I mean, if I was to do, uh, that's not to say every movie has to be so goody sure, two sure. shoes and Sweet later on, you know, I mean, I just think it has to be justifiable. And even if you're going to show evil as evil, that's great. But there's so many movies out there that aren't positive, that aren't, you know, uh, that are gratuitous and just, you don't, I just don't need it. I don't want to be sitting in a theater with my kids and just having that uncomfortable feeling. And mm -hmm. it's just, you know, it's nice to just put, you know, for at least a few hours to take someone away from that. Now, people don't realize, I didn't realize, you co-wrote Paul Blart and you had a great hand in this film. Right. Where do you start when you're writing these scripts? Where do you start? You know, I just, it's, it's, this one I've been is a passion project for me. It's been you, you know, love the sport. Well, I love the sport, but it's also combined with the teaching and the inspiration, and it's mm -hmm. something that I, again wanting to put out something positive in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember I've had some great teachers that kind of affected me to this day. You know, they gave me some positive principles. They were they were very you know supportive in what I wanted to do, mm -hmm. and here it is thirty years later, and I'm still kind of you know shaped by what they did. So it's yeah. it really shows you that you know teaching doesn't just end when you leave school. You know, so mm -hmm. it really can you know that cement is settling. But you know, you take with you, you know, what they give you, and, and they can likewise work with a bad teacher. You yeah. know, so it's important to you know to be inspired and to, to shape these kids the right way. And you know, like I said, I'm, I'm I've taken very positive uh, aspects from mm -hmm. them. But you start with the character. I mean, Paul <coughs> Blart was obviously a mall cop. You went to malls and actually researched. We watched. Yes. You know, I just thought it would be funny. It started with me being. A cop who didn't, you know, I was gonna be a regular cop. We didn't know, you know, but but I didn't want to have the authority of a regular cop. So then it went down. Maybe I'd be an auxiliary cop or some type of, you know. And then we thought I saw these mall cops on these segways, which I thought was extremely fun. And I felt bad for them because they, no one really respected them. And I I never made Paul Blart to be, you know, mocking them. In fact, you know, I wanted to represent their humanity. Oh, it's their Rocky. I wanted to make their Rocky. That's it. You know. You did. Yeah. You did. Let's talk about the physical comedy. This has got to be. Hard. I mean, just watching it, particularly this movie. This movie is hard. Some of these shots look yeah. like they were real shots. They did shots. connect. Yeah, they did connect. And <laughs> that was the key to it. You know, in making this movie, the US, UFC gave us their blessing mm -hmm. to to use their name. And they've never given their name to any other movie. So uh, they were concerned about making it realistic enough that, you know, and you weren't making a mockery of it. That right. wouldn't be Paul Blart in the ring. Right. Right. You know, but real. So I, I promised them, I assured them, and I worked out really hard. Uh, I got in shape for it. But in training it, and also, I 
I had to make the fight scenes messy. I didn't want everything to be spot mm -hmm. on where every shot connects and every, yeah. you know, this blocking and it looks like an old karate kung fu movie yeah. where it looks like a dance. I wanted it to be sloppy. Mm -hmm. I wanted it to be messy because mm -hmm. that's the way fights are. So, you know, yeah, and that's why this character would fight. Certainly. Exactly, yeah. certainly. I yeah. didn't have the technique, you know, growing up and all that. I, you know, it's something I took on later in life. So we did it that way. But unfortunately, you're not in the same spot a lot of the times. And mm -hmm. you're working with these professionals and when you're rolling around and they're trained to hit you. <laughs> oh, man, I caught some shots. Yikes. Now, yeah. 14 months months you trained for this movie, yes. 14 months, and then, I'll tell you a funny story in a minute, 14 months, then you step out of a town car and yank your back. Is this a funny, well now I'm out of shape, I got back out of shape. It, it doesn't matter how much good shape, that's that back is always, I did it in London, the, you can I do, work out every day. You could be brushing your teeth and it and, goes out, I go, oh, I can't move, <laughs> and that's what happened. Someone called my name and I went, uh, and I was down. I was then like, it's, then it's just three don't days. Move, don't talk to me. Exactly, it's like literally three days, Gosh. so. That's a, no, that's a horrible thing that it's happened. The worst. It's much worse than get. I think I'd rather yes, get punched, punched in the face than, than the back. Uh, let's talk about here comes the boom in a little more depth. Um, I love the idea that you have this teacher who is a bit confused, and yet he sees, and of all things, a music teacher. Why a music teacher? Why a teacher connected to the arts rather than a gym teacher or some other teacher? I never played an instrument growing up, but I remember my friends who did and how passionate they were about it. And uh, when you're cutting programs like that, it's, it's not just about learning about playing a clarinet or a saxophone or whatever it is, but it's what music brings to these people. And I've seen that. And I've seen how music affects you know, everybody to this day. You know, uh, it can make or break a movie. It can, you know, there, you can hear two bars of a song and it takes you back specifically to a time in your life where you like, you see it so yeah. clearly. I mean, music can do that. It can move you. You know, uh, these UFC fighters, they use it for inspiration. You know, they get work, you know, when you're running on a treadmill, you know, yeah. what, what motivates yeah. you? They use it for intimidation. You know, music can mm. be used for everything. It can, it can really heal. It can do, you know, mm -hmm. they, so it's, from every aspect, I wanted to get that in throughout the movie. Hmm. And the Henry Winkler is so great in this movie. There's no one better than the Fonz. I mean, he's, <laughs> he's, he's the nicest man I've ever met, by the way. He's really, he's really sweet. And, he had and nice things to say about you, too. He said that your, your world view is in every moment of this film. Well, that's nice. Do you think that's true? Well, I, I hope so, except for the throwing up part, but, but yes. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he, he was really great. And he was, the, you know, he was the part that if you don't buy Henry Winkler in this movie, uh -huh. you had to buy him and get, get behind supporting him. Because if you didn't root for Henry, you don't buy me doing something as crazy as, you know, sacrificing myself right. like that. Willing to go and, exactly. and get into the ring to raise right. money to keep him That's in, his, right. in his job. Intimidation! Now, the other great sacrifice, I'm sure it was a real penance for you, to work opposite Selma Hayek in some of those I scenes. Know. That was really, it's, you could see the pain in your face. By the way, I've worked with her, you know, our families love each other, we get along, we, we, I've worked with her on a number of movies before, two grown ups, and yeah. I've done sketch work with her, and we've always gotten along, and she's great. Uh, and she wanted to do this movie, and I wanted her to, but of course my, I go, no one's gonna believe that you're my love. <laughs> this is the struggle I go through every every time I cast a beautiful woman. I thought it woman. was very believable, I have I, to tell you. We, we, tried to, we, we tried to ugly her up. We oh. tried to, and you can't do it. You cannot do it. We tried to dress her down, and I'm going, no one's gonna Scars believe this. Scars and yes. warts on her, Egg, nothing. Nothing, good. nothing. Uh, well, but it, it comes great. off well, though. The chemistry is great. We had a lot of fun. fun when Henry Winkler said, your worldview is in every moment of this movie, it got me thinking, and I went back to some of my original notes. There are moments here and I think there's a real faithful heart to this movie, if you will, mm -hmm. where you see these fighters around a table, they're in a guy's basement, they're eating pasta, and suddenly the, your fight coach stands up and tells the story of Jacob wrestling with the angels, mm -hmm. and, or the angel, and compares that to what you're doing. Obviously, that was put there intentionally, mm -hmm. as are the prayer scenes before mm -hmm. all of the fights. 
What are you trying to communicate there? That how important faith is, and by the way, that a lot of these fighters are driven by faith, and okay. it, it it gives them the drive that they need and uh, to get through anything. I mean, mm -hmm. again, the fighting is a metaphor, but yeah. the faith is there, you know, and you see it within them, and it was very important, and it's also very important to not knock people over the head with it. You know, it's that's very always the danger. It's very every day. Exactly, but you know, it, it's it's. The, the you know it's it's the biggest requirement in my life so it's very important to me so uh, I want to show it and I want to show it respectfully and in the right way mm -hmm. and uh, but not be obvious and on it's, the nose yeah exactly it. it doesn't have to be over the top and, you know you, you, I think it's stronger when you're not you know when you mm -hmm. kind of lay off and you show that, that these little things uh, mm -hmm. happen and and that's what that's you know where it's at and mm -hmm. that's you know I, like I said I've experienced with all these fighters so mm -hmm. it, it was it was nice to put it in the movie you had a big return to your faith personally. Mm -hmm. As a Catholic, yes. Can you tell me anything about it? Well, I, I you know, it was. Uh, I've always. My father was a very, very, you know, devout Catholic, and mm -hmm. uh, I grew up Catholic, and yeah. uh, you know, living with, you know, going to church all the time, and and, and grew up and had faith in God, yeah. but never really, you know, connected enough. Mm -hmm. And I remember him always telling me, uh, uh, as I was, I was shooting Hitch, I think it was in uh, in, in New York, and. 2004 or something like that. And I remember him huh. saying it was Good Friday huh. to tone down the partying and going out. Don't, you know, you know, remember this is the day our Lord died, you know, mm -hmm. and explaining it to me. And I was kind of like, oh, okay, so I can't go out and do anything like that. Mm -hmm. And he's like, mm, you know, just really kind of harness, the, you know, that mm -hmm. and, and understand what he did for us. So just really. So I said, uh, I noticed, I was by myself in New York City, and I saw that The Passion of the Christ was playing. And I said, Dad, can I go to the movies and see The Passion of the Christ? And he goes, absolutely, you can go yeah. see that. So I went and saw uh, The Passion of the Christ by myself, you know, grabbed the popcorn, yeah. sat down in front, <laughs> and go, this is great, I'm gonna Not kill exactly two hours. to watch with popcorn. Exactly, <laughs> I just went in there, boom, and was completely moved by it, yeah. you know, and it really just, it, it blew me away. And hmm. uh, it, it was, you know, it was life changing. And it's one of these little shifts that happen where you continually try to, you know, better yourself and become the best version of yourself, mm -hmm. really. You know, and it, that was a big one for mm -hmm. sure. And then yeah. being able to meet Caviezel later on and talk to him about it and, you yeah. know, get all his experiences throughout the filming of that. You know, I was just, it was well, just it was put me on the path, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah no, I, I interviewed he and Mel during that period. Yes. Quite something. Yes. In the, when I when I saw your movie, just to try to tie all of this together, not only is it about sacrifice, but it really is about finding your personal calling. Mm -hmm. And there's a moment where I think your character talks about passion and commitment. Do you think that's lacking today oh, in yeah. our society? Absolutely. I mean, uh, commitment to values, to faith, whatever it may be. You know, I mean, honestly, I think it's a, a very me society everything everything's me now gratification now what can I do mm -hmm. and no one does put in the time and the effort and the passion and 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 we lack people stepping up and it's so nice to see it when someone does it when someone goes outside of the comfort zone and stands up for what they believe in and uh, it moves so many you know it really does and that's you know what we wanted to you know convey in this film that um, you know, one little shift can just shift so many around you, and it, and it's like I said, it's that ripple effect that just carries on. Well, that's the boom, sonic yes. boom. Yeah. yeah. No, no. I, I thought as I watched it, I thought, oh, you no, know, it was it. What? Why do you do this? Why do you put yourself through the arduous process of making a film, going through this, talking to strangers all day long? Why do this? It's I, I love it. You know. Um, uh, he's given me a gift to be able to do it. I don't know how long it'll last. I don't know how long people will want to see it, but for the time being, and this is you know what I'm supposed to do, I'm mm -hmm. I'm going to do it. I'm going to try to do it the best of my ability, you know. Mm -hmm. And I, like everybody else, have like I said in this character, become complacent at times and mm -hmm. start saying, you know what, I need to shift my life a little bit more this way and help out a little bit here and try this and and just constantly try to make things a little bit better, including my work. And you know, that's it. It's just a journey and. Uh, you know, and I'm just trying to complete it. It's an exciting journey. We, we love watching it. I'm a final question. What do you want your children, Shea and Sienna Marie and Cannon, to say about Dad and his work years from now? Oh, man. Well, I just, you know, uh, more importantly than my work, I just hope that they honestly are, are, are good people and have... Uh, uh, a true, true faith and, and love of their creator. And then I'm happy. I don't care about my work as long as, it, you know, I can instill that in them.
Here comes the boom. Opens in theaters everywhere October 12th. It's great and a fun family film, particularly for boys. Some younger kids might be put off by the cage matches, but they're exciting without ever lapsing into gore. Here comes the boom is in theaters this weekend. Up next, a boom of a different sort was heard when Salvatore Cordelioni was named Archbishop of San Francisco. We'll talk about the challenges he faces, the controversies, and his hope for his new archdiocese. The World Over Live continues in a moment. Stay right there. Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to the World Over. My next guest is one of the youngest archbishops in the United States. He's an accomplished canon lawyer. He served as the Bishop of Oakland, California from 2009 until this year, when the Pope named him the Archbishop of San Francisco. Not without some controversy, here to discuss his new position as the leader of half a million Catholics in San Francisco and the delicate sensibilities he'll have to navigate there is Archbishop Salvatore Cordelioni. Archbishop Cordelioni, first of all, thanks for being with us. I want to start with your homily, and it was a beautiful homily that you opened uh, the beginning of your tenure in San Francisco with. You quoted St. Yes. Francis, which seemed so appropriate, uh, where the Lord told Francis, rebuild my house. How will you yes. go about rebuilding this archdiocese, which in so many ways is sort of, I think, ground zero for the culture and the church in America? A lot of people see the San Francisco and the whole Bay Area that way. Uh, I think what the issues we're dealing with here are emblematic of what we're dealing with in many parts of the world, certainly all throughout this country. It, but yes, perhaps ground zero, certainly in a more intense way here. Mm -hmm. I would take uh, the Holy Father's uh, vision for, uh, for the new Pope John Paul II and now with Pope Benedict, their vision for the new evangelization which is using new means with the new fervor, uh, finding, again, speaking the timeless message of the gospel in ways that uh, can resonate with people today. Mm -hmm. Pope John Paul has given us this wonderful whole new way, way of looking at reality, a vision, a world vision of, that's now called theology of the body, understanding God's revelation working through our own bodies and the whole nuptial mystery of, of our life in Christ. Pope Benedict is giving us the vision of understanding the Second Vatican Council with this, as he calls it, the hermeneutic of reform mm -hmm. and continuity. He's now called the Year of Faith. In fact, today is the very day, anniversary of the opening of the Second Vatican Council, 50 yeah. years ago today. Yeah. So uh, the, our Holy Fathers have given us already the vision. I would hope to uh, understand as best as I can the vision and direction they want to move the church in. but. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not a vision I come in come into the archdiocese with pre-planned. Uh, a, a bishop newly arriving in a diocese has to do a lot of listening, a lot of observing, getting to know the diocese, getting to know the priests, the people in the parishes, mm -hmm. and so forth, so that together we can craft a more specific vision to further the new evangelization in this specific mm -hmm. part of the world. Uh, Archbishop, uh, they are, we have gotten uh, flooded with emails uh, at the time of your appointment. So many people excited mm -hmm. about the appointment, yet on the ground there were also, they didn't exactly roll out the red carpet for you in the local media, uh, which is pretty par for the course. Uh, and they picked up on the fact that you were head of the bishop's subcommittee on the defense of marriage. You were a major proponent of Proposition 8, which which was a proposition defining marriage as the union between a man and a woman. Um, yes. This has become very controversial because they say here is this archbishop coming into an area that has always been open to gay lifestyles, gay unions, and now gay marriage. How do you engage this community and Catholics who feel that this is somehow um, a right, and that the church is stepping on the ability of two people to come together in love. This is a whole uh, day-long worth of conversation, mm -hmm. actually. But as I've, I've emphasized, the marriage, there's a public good in marriage, a man and a woman coming together to bond with each other and to bring new life in the world so that those children might be connected to their mothers and their fathers. That's uh, the best that we could do for children. The best situation isn't always... A, 
possible, but we should do what we can to encourage that in society. It's not a referendum on how anyone works out their intimate relationships. Mm -hmm. I think you hit a very key point about our own people, helping our own people to understand what marriage really is, what the public good of marriage is, what it means as a sacrament, the mystical meaning of marriage, how it's written in our very nature. I think we need to do a lot of catechesis of our own people to get them to understand this to, so that they, in turn, can share this good news. This is good news. If it's, we articulate it well in way that, ways that will get people to think about it more deeply rather than in a rather superficial way, that uh, this will resonate with people. Mm -hmm. uh, this is part of the task of the new evangelization, which is Pope Benedict you know, keeps encouraging us to take this fresh look at the council to uh, mine the treasures more deeply. The, the council's uh, decree on the, uh, the, the lay faithful was to uh, equip our, our lay faithful for evangelizing the world out in the marketplace, in the world in which they live, in the mm -hmm. workplace, in their schools, in their communities. Uh, mm -hmm. This is really the, the, that was the thrust of the council as part of the call, the universal call to holiness. So I think it's uh, appropriating this vision of the council and making it real in terms of helping our own people to understand the good of marriage so that they can be advocates for marriage out mm -hmm. uh, in the marketplace, as they say. Uh, Archbishop, there's another story that's, that's broken. Um, the, the Most Holy Redeemer Parish in the Castro District, which is a uh, majority, uh, it's a gay district in San Francisco. They have had a uh, uh, event there every year for the last three years. This year, they were told by the pastor, quote, no drag queens. Apparently, there were men dressed as women who were emceeing this event. The, the, the members of this organization came out and they said, quote, this is ridiculous and discriminatory to say they can't meet on church property. And that they suggested that you and the pastor were, quote, trying to get rid of gays and drag queens. Is that what you're trying to do? Uh, with regard to this specific incident, uh, all I know about is what I've read in the media mm -hmm. <laughs> and heard in the media. Uh, I did, uh, after this story broke, I was at the, the Archdiocesan uh, Chancery Office to plan installation events. Mm -hmm. And we had about a two minute conversation about it. Mm -hmm. That's really all that conversation I've had with the Archdiocese about yeah. this event. But what it, the situation was the parish was renting out its facilities to an outside group. This was an outside group. Mm -hmm. uh, so certainly it's within the discretion of any church uh, or any organization uh, in terms of whether or not they will rent out their facilities. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't, this wasn't even an, an, an internal parish group or diocesan group or anything like that. Having watched your career in Oakland and, and uh, we, I, I know people who worked with you at the Apostolic Signatura in Rome, um, the depictions that I, I read in the media that somehow you are um, discriminatory or wanting to, you know, clear the streets of, of, of gays and lesbians, uh, does, that, does that at all get under your skin? Because it, it seems to run at odds with certainly the stories I've always heard of you. Um, and, and how do you combat that since that seems to be a narrative that's being advanced now before you've even done anything in the diocese? Yes, uh, I think uh, we need to uh, be, uh, speak the truth in charity and uh, try to build relationships. I think it's easy to have stereotypes when you don't know an individual or a group of individuals, whether you know that's a race or a nationality. Mm -hmm. People easily form stereotypes. Those stereotypes break down when you enter into a human relationship and get to know the other as a human being. And, uh, I know that would be advantageous to me as well, to help understand the people who, who live here better. So mm -hmm. I would hope to begin making those connections, building relationships, joining together with people. There are a number of issues we could work on of common concern. Mm -hmm. And I think through that, when we can connect on a human level, it helps to break down those, those stereotypes, which can often result in, in hostility and, mm -hmm. and work against the common good in, in building a truly just and peaceful society. Uh, let's talk for a moment. You are fluent in Spanish, which some people may not know. What and how do you reach out to the Hispanic community in your very large diocese? And there is a major Hispanic uh, population there in San Francisco. Yes, and I uh, found out uh, shortly before coming here, much larger than, than I had thought. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I hope to be as present as possible in the archdiocese. It's always a, a balancing act between the many demands on a bishop's schedule. But mm -hmm. one example is just last Saturday, um, a pastor of one of our parishes, of a, a very largely Hispanic parish, it's almost all Hispanic. There is a small uh, but significant Tongan community as well, invited me for their parish feast day. It's the parish of St. Francis in East Palo Alto. So I went there on the Saturday after the installation when they were celebrating the feast day to spend time with them, mingle with them. Uh, they put on some wonderful performances of music and dancing and speak to the people in both English and Spanish. These types of things, being able to connect in, in their parishes, in significant uh, uh, moments in, in cultural and, and, and devotional uh, moments in, in the life of the community. Uh, this Saturday, there is going to be a mass in Spanish for all of the Spanish speaking in the archdiocese that uh, I will be present at and be able to speak with them. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, connecting in this way, I, it's, uh, since I've, in my pastoral ministry, I've always felt very uh, comfortable with and energized by uh, Spanish -speaking, uh, the Spanish-speaking community. Mm -hmm. And I find I have a lot in common with them in terms of my own upbringing, the sort of family culture that I grew up in. So mm -hmm. I, I feel at home and I, I very much enjoy myself in that culture. But before we move on, as you said a moment ago, this is the uh, 50th anniversary of the Vatican II Council, the 20th anniversary of the Catechism, and of course the beginning of uh, Pope Benedict's Year of Faith. In your reflection, in your opening homily, uh, in your own archdiocese, you picked up on a line that Pope Benedict uh, had in his introductory uh, writing about this year of faith, and it was the joy of believing. How do you inculcate that to your people and to all those watching? Uh, what I've done in, especially in confirmation homilies or talks that I give to young people in, in particular, to draw analogies with other aspects of life, there's a basic lesson that if you really want to uh, reach that level of joy or um, excellence, it takes a lot of hard work and a lot of discipline. So I always give the example of sports and of music. You, know, you have to practice hard, practice arpeggios, and if it's a wind instrument, they're breathing exercise you have to do. It's, it's not a lot of fun. It's a lot of hard work. It takes discipline. It takes consistency. But when you get really good and you're excellent in your performance, that's when you enjoy it. Same thing with sports. It takes a lot of going through the drills, the exercises, the proper diet even. Uh, but if you work hard at it and then your team excels, that's when it becomes enjoyable. So this is true also on the moral and the spiritual level. If people want to find true joy in life. Yes, it's going to take discipline. It's going to take some self-denial. Uh, but it's for the greater good. It's the joy that God wants us to have. And I mm -hmm. would always suggest to them to look at a, a, an older couple that's been married for a long time and are still happily married. How did they get to that point in marriage? It, mm -hmm. what, every day wasn't bliss. It took for them a lot of hard work. Yeah. They undoubtedly hurt each other along the way. They had to forgive and keep giving in order to get to that level of joy that God is calling, uh, calling all of us to in our own vocation. Archbishop Cordelione, you mentioning joy, uh, self-deprecation, I've always thought, is an important part of showing joy and, and a certain confidence. And in your homily, uh, there was a little self-deprecation referring to an incident in late August that you were involved in where you, you were driving in the car with your mother, uh, I guess from, from a dinner with friends, and you were stopped at a checkpoint. Tell me what happened that night. Uh, first, let me play a little clip of the homily, and then, then we'll come yeah. to you. I know in my own life, God has always had a way of putting me in my place. His little and sometimes big ways of reminding me of my need to depend upon him and to attend to the work of my own rebuilding from within. I would say, though, that with the latest episode in my life, God has outdone himself. So your thoughts, what happened that night, Archbishop? Well, uh, I mean, this was tremendously embarrassing, obviously. Uh, I was uh, with friends at this dinner, um, family friends of mine with their other families. They were all, you know, devout Catholic people. We were having a very pleasant evening. Um, I stopped when I thought right before, it was right before I reached my limit. That was a miscalculation. Uh, but, uh, but I stopped when I thought it was the right time to stop. 
we continued visiting for a while. I let some time pass before I got uh, behind the wheel to mm -hmm. drive my mother home. And I was with a, a priest friend of mine uh, visiting from out of the country. Uh, so there were the three of us in the car. M my mother lives near San Diego State University, um, which is actually where I grew up. She still lives in the house that we all grew up in, so I had to drive past the campus of the university. And it was the beginning of the school year, a Friday night. The police had set up a DUI checkpoint. Oh. I, even though I had driven past there my whole life, I had never seen a DUI checkpoint there yeah. before. Apparently, they do set them up regularly, which makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, and I had miscalculated. I was a little bit over the limit. Uh, but uh, well, uh, the police I, were very, uh, the police were polite to me and uh, somewhat apologetic, and I was being cooperative. I even thanked them at one point for the mm. work that they're doing because I yeah, well, recognized well, the importance of it. As a native New Orleanian archbishop, when I read this, I thought, if the man doesn't have an open daiquiri gallon in his passenger seat, they should have let him go. I mean, you know, we <laughs> drive through daiquiris uh, in, in New I've Orleans. Heard that. So. I've heard that in New Orleans. Yeah, yes. but you were there with your mother, for goodness sake, in the car. I, I just, yes. when I saw this story, it is, again, it's being used, it seems to me, um, in some of the press accounts to sort of undercut you before you've really done anything. In in the diocese. And, and, and going to that point, there was a Pew survey this week, and it, it surveyed how people reflect their own faith and what faith they'll admit to. And you've got 48% Protestant, an all-time low, 22% Catholic, and 22% unaffiliated, people who simply say they don't know what they are. How do you break into that group? How do you arrest them? It seems secularity is winning the day. In, uh, in, in many parts of our culture, and certainly here in the United States? Uh, well, I'll refer back to what I've already mentioned about this new way of looking at, at the world, at understanding the deposit of faith or the timeless truth of the gospel with the theology of the body. Mm -hmm. When this is presented to young people in a convincing, dynamic, uh, winsome way, uh, it resonates with them, mm -hmm. and it, they get excited about the faith. And because... What it taps into is we all have the same deepest desire, and that's to love and to be loved. Mm -hmm. And what does that really mean, and how do we live that out in our bodies? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's by tapping into what people's deepest desires are. There's so many uh, false promises, you know, and so many deceptions. People are falling into so many traps, mm -hmm. looking for love in all the wrong places, as the song goes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, the faith... The truth of Christ is the right place. We have a way now of, according to our modern-day mentality, or postmodern mentality, I suppose I should say, in the way that people think now, it's a way that resonates with them because it talks about our very bodies. How do we experience love in our bodies? Archbishop, before I let you go, a number of our email correspondents have written in. Uh, you're a canon lawyer. You know the requirements of the, the can canon law better than any of us uh, looking in and certainly better than this host. They're asking about a member of your archdiocese, uh, former Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, who is a professed Catholic and yet has consistently held positions in opposition to the church and publicly so, stated so. Some have said this is a scandal. How do you plan on addressing this situation? One thing I've said all along is that we need a massive uh, catechetical or recatechetical effort of our own people in terms of understanding the concept of worthiness to receive communion. Mm -hmm. uh, I think an awful lot of Catholics don't understand this anymore. I'm, that we need to be properly disposed. Classically, we speak of that in a state of grace. Mm -hmm. That one, um, So communion, it's not, it's not a gesture of welcome. It's not a gesture of affirmation. It's, it's uh, our uniting ourselves with Christ in his sacrifice and uh, a statement that uh, we profess, believe, and practice what the church teaches. So the first thing is to help our people understand why some people are not properly disposed to receive communion. And when that's the case, we also have a sacrament to take care of that. Mm -hmm. So we can help people get there so they can be properly disposed toward receiving. That's, that's the first thing we need to do. Then the next thing we need to do is educate our people why certain sins are, are serious or, and why, and then these principles of moral theology about being uh, a complicity with, with the serious evil, what's in the natural moral law versus mm -hmm. what is revealed truth. There are a lot of other um, areas we need to teach our people about, but I think we need to start with helping our people understand that 
sense of worthiness to receive communion. Okay. Acknowledging, of course, none of us on our own merits is worthy. It's only the Lord who makes us worthy. But in another sense, we do have to be in the state of grace to be properly disposed. Very good. Archbishop Sal Cordelioni, we wish you the best, uh, and we will be watching Thank things you. out in San Francisco, and hopefully we'll see you soon at the Bishop's Conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Archbishop. Coming up next, the Pope kicked off a year of faith at a Mass from St. Peter's Square on Thursday. And a special someone you may know was there. I'll tell you who and show you some highlights of Pope Benedict's homily. What does this year of faith mean to you? The World Over Live continues in a moment. Stay right there. Once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to the World Over. Thursday marked the 50th anniversary of the Second Vatican Council. Pope Benedict celebrated Mass to open the Year of Faith, 13 months, which he's setting aside to do what he calls combat the spiritual malaise he sees in today's society. In a moment, the Pope explains the Year of Faith in his own words. But first, during the opening ceremony, Pope Benedict presented messages to representatives of various groups, artists, clergy, women. Joining us now by phone is the person who represented women all over the world when she received that special message from the Pope today. She's been a guest on The World Over and is no stranger to those of you who read National Catholic Register and National Review. She is... Catherine Jean Lopez, and she joins us from Rome. Hey, Kalo. Now, you, when, when I saw this, that you were representing all women, I thought this is like that Whitney Houston song, You're Every Woman. What was the experience like? It, it, it wasn't quite like the Oprah show. It was a lot cooler than that, fortunately. <laughs> Um, I um, well, I, I I got a phone call actually last week asking um, me if uh, I participate. Apparently, the the council for the new evangelization, the new council, came up with this idea, or 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 someone came up with this idea last week, and the idea was to recreate something that Paul VI did at the end of the uh, of of the Second Vatican Council. Right. These these messages are actually were actually that the Pope gave today were the exact same messages, um, and it's remarkable. You know, ever ancient, ever new is what was was going through my mind dur during this because the whole idea is this is this is continuous, and the whole idea of the Second Vatican Council was the idea of the Gospels, right? We're, 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 this is all continuous, and we're just renewing the same message, and it's just remarkable how all the messages are as relevant today as they were 50 mm -hmm. years ago. Now, what is that message? Can you give us the Reader's Digest? What was the special message to women? <laughs> the Reader's Digest version of it, it's a big, long message that I got. Okay, the Twitter um, for version. The, for the women of the world, but the, <laughs> but the bottom line comes in the, in the, the uh, very last clause, uh -huh. which is, it is for you to save the peace of the world. So a number, a number of the, the people in, in, in the group, the, the peoples who received these messages, we, we walked away grateful for the opportunity. Everyone to a man said thank you to the Pope. That was what we said. That was, yeah. was the communication. But you, you really you feel the responsibility, you know, mm -hmm. if we're really going to live as Christians in the world. Now, uh, and, Catherine, and that's what this was about. Before I let you go, how were you selected? I do not know the answer to that question, to be honest with you. I assume it was, I, 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 as you do, I have, I, I know people, I have sources and, and, and friends in the Vatican. I imagine it was some nice American there who's familiar with. Well, it was a me. great honor, and I'm delighted people could get a chance to see you there. And uh, you look like you had fun. Now bring me back a blessed rosary, Kalo. Will do. All right. Thanks so much. Have fun. Talk to you soon. Here is Pope Benedict explaining, in his own words, what this year of faith is all about, just in case you missed that opening Mass from Rome. Here, the Pope says, in the light of these words, we can understand what I myself felt at the time. During the Council, there was an emotional tension as we faced the common task of making the truth and beauty of the faith shine out in our time without sacrificing it to the demands of the present or leaving it tied to the past. The eternal presence of God resounds in the faith transcending time, yet it can only be welcomed by us in our own unrepeatable today. 
Therefore, I believe, Pope Benedict said, that the most important thing, especially on such a significant occasion as this, is to revive in the whole Church that positive tension, that yearning to announce Christ again to contemporary man. But so that this interior thrust towards the new evangelization neither remain just an idea nor be lost in confusion, it needs to be built on a concrete and precise basis. And this basis is the documents of the Second Vatican Council, the place where it found expression. This is why the Pope went on to say, I've often insisted on the need to return, as it were, to the letter of the Council that is, to its texts, also to draw from them its authentic spirit. And why I have repeated that the true legacy of Vatican II is to be found in them. Reference to the document saves us from the extremes of anachronistic nostalgia and running too far ahead and allows what is new to be welcomed in a context of continuity. The Council did not formulate anything new, he said, in matters of faith, nor did it wish to replace what was ancient. Rather, it concerned itself with seeing that the same faith might continue to be lived in the present day, that it might remain a living faith in a world of change. Benedict then has just gone to say, if we place ourselves in harmony with the authentic approach which Blessed John XXIII wished to give Vatican II, we will be able to realize it during this year of faith, following the same path of the Church as she continuously endeavors to deepen the deposit, the deposit of faith entrusted to her by Christ. The Council Fathers wished to represent the faith in a meaningful way, and if they open themselves trustingly to dialogue with the modern world, it is because they were certain of their faith, of the solid rock on which they stood. In the years following, however, many embraced uncritically the dominant mentality, placing in doubt the very foundations of the deposit of faith, which they sadly no longer felt able to accept as truth. That is all the time we have. The show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Go to RaymondArroyo.com. The Twitter and Facebook pages are linked on the left-hand side of the site. I will be commentating on the vice presidential debate in real time on Twitter and Facebook, so don't miss that. Be sure to tune in next week. My exclusive interview with best-selling suspense novelist Dean Kuntz will be featured, and possibly GOP vice presidential candidate Paul Ryan will be here. Until next week. We'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, I'm Raymond Arroyo. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye now.